G'day guys and welcome back to the Back Pocket Plug Out Podcast. My name is Caden McDonald and I'm joined by my co-host today, Connor Rogers. Roger, how are you, mate? Uh, good, but nowhere near as good as you. We normally sort of film this on a Monday or a, or a Tuesday, <laughs> but we had to let it go all the way to a Wednesday because I thought you need your recovery time and um, I thought you still might be a sopping mess if we did it any earlier. How are you feeling? Are we still riding the high or is there a bit of postnatal depression going on? Mate, I am still riding the high. Obviously, the Melbourne Footy Club, which we've been discussing a lot this year, have won the Premiership. I honestly, I can't believe it. it it's struggling to sink in. We probably should have done the pod straight away to cash in on the views, but I was just scattered for a couple of days and we had to uh, compose ourselves, but we're doing it <laughs> middle of the week. Um Rog, I, I just I cannot believe what I witnessed on Saturday night. And I just keep thinking back to about round six on the pod or m- maybe episode <laughs> six and the D's had had six or seven to eight good performances because I reckon we started the pod in round two. So um, it was probably episode six and you just go, yeah, listen, Doss, what I'm seeing, they it stacks up in prelims, this. And if it stacks up in prelims, there's no reason why it can't stack up in a grand final. So you're going to win the grand final. And I'm going... <laughs> I can't believe you've just said that. Like, take that back, touch some wood. Let's um, uh, let, let's touch the cross and grab some garlic and grab a horseshoe because that, <laughs> that is the biggest moz you put on us. And every time, like, we stacked up in big finals, I kept thinking back to it. Yeah, bloody oath, this brand that we've got is built for this moment. And there was no surprise. It was a very convincing final series. And after three-quarter time, it was a very convincing grand final. And they've done it. Well, I just never, I said it at the time, I've never seen anything quite like it Um, because I'm so used to being a Carlton supporter. When we turn the ball over, which we do more than I'd ever like to see, we are exposed straight away. Down the guts, handball, goal. They just couldn't kick the goal any easier. But when I sat down, we went to two or three D's games at the start of the year, back when we were allowed crowds, (laughs) and uh, you would turn the ball over occasionally And you were set up like a bloody brick wall, like you were defending your kingdom, like you may as well have had a moat around your Ford 50 because there was just no one one getting into it with May and Lever just running the show back there. And I thought, with this sort of defensive structure and buy-in, I just couldn't fathom how you could possibly uh, be overrun in a finals game. And it's come to fruition. I'm wrapped for you. And uh, when you sort of... Close your eyes now and uh, you, you think about the game or the first thing you think about when you wake up and you think the D's won the flag. Is there a moment specifically on the day or in the game where you go, yeah, that's my grand final moment or that's the bit you were happiest in? You know, is the one moment you keep on going back to? Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's probably obvious the third term was crazy. Uh, there was one moment in particular, well, there was, there was a million actually, but um, <laughs> when Fritter uh, kicked, kicked the set shot and it got us back within 14 points and then the next clearance, he tries to take a hanger on Eastern Wood's head, falls to ground. He, he, he lands on his feet like a cat and kicks the second within 30 seconds. I was like, we're going to be hard to stop from here. Um, yeah, we're back. So, so that was one of the moments. And then at, in the third term, there was a moment <clears throat> that I don't reckon many people, well, a lot of people probably remember, but Gus Brayshaw goes back, kicks a clutch goal to put us in front. And it was one of those ones where he, he'd be forgiven for missing. He was sort of 45 out, 45 degree angle. And it's like, <laughs> it, it, it's an easy kick in terms of the angle isn't too sharp, but... It's big pressure, grand final. This is to put us back in front. He goes back and slots it. And then I reckon a contest and a half later in the back line, there's a long ball forward. Josh Shackey's running back with the flight and Brayshaw just drills him. And um, they cut away to the ball and then they cut back to both Shackey and Brayshaw on the ground. And it's like a quick camera shot. They cut back to him and all you see is Brayshaw on the ground and you see two hands grab it from under his shoulders and just pick him up. And then they cut back to the action in the ground and it's Cozzy and Ben Brown um, winning the footy in the middle. And it was just like so hectic. It was like there was a big collision. It cuts to the footy in the centre. Then it cuts back to the blokes on the ground. Then Gussie Brayshaw just gets lifted up from two hands out of nowhere. The camera shot. Who was it? I reckon it was Lever. The camera shot was for like 0.5 of a second. And when I saw that, I was like, this is unbelievable. The boys are just playing for each other. We're in a war. They've rolled the sleeves up. This is elite. Yeah, uh, fantastic. Uh, I think 
when I think <laughs> about my the, the grand final moment from that day for me, when Petrarca kicked that dribbler, oh, that dribbler, <laughs> I think that's when everyone knew it's game over. It's, you couldn't stop it from here. Like yeah. when you think about the the Malchewski goal and the Leo Barry mark, and, and you know the the Brendan Goddard mark, even though the Saints didn't win that grand final. <laughs> but you think about grand final moments. I think the one that I'll, I'll remember from this game in twenty years' time is that Petrarca goal. That was he stamped himself as I think even just from one game he stamped himself as probably going to be the best player in the game. It was one of those moments. So I was going into the game thinking a Jack Viney might might pinch a Norm Smith. Like a Jack Viney might play out of his skin. But after seeing what Pedraka did, and even Oliver. Oliver was unbelievable. But after seeing what Pedraka did, I, I, I was sort of surprised that I didn't tip him for the Norm Smith because he is that player. Christian Pedraka, he's got this NBA swagger about him when the going gets tough and when he slotted that goal watch the 30 seconds of the camera on him he has possessed eyes and he's walking back breathing fire out of his nostrils and he's looking up at the screen and he's got his chest out and he's just sort of nodding to himself and it is this swagger that like all right boys I'll put you on, on me back and, and I'll get us over the line here and I could not imagine what that feels like I can't imagine that either just just Going back, going, nah, I'm not letting this lose. Like, the, yeah. Oh, and then if you watch, I think there was about, what, 55 seconds to go after he kicked that. And I said to dad, I'm like, I just want one more. So we're up by 12. I want one more. Uh, the next clearance, I think it's Petrarca and Liber. He blind turns him, bursts out of the stoppage, puts five metres between <clears throat> him and any other midfielder. Um, he, I think he gives it to, to Clary, who gives it to Tom Sparrow. I'm going, Tom Sparrow, spot someone over the top. Tom Sparrow <laughs> steps off a boot. Bombs away. The shepherd <laughs> on the line. Oh, Tom McDonald on the line. Oh, oh, I couldn't believe it because I'm going, when's he going to put his hands up and try and clunk it? But he just... He just Barges <laughs> uh, Zane Gordy over the fence. Well, let's um, let's rewind a couple of steps and go through the game because at quarter time I thought the game was over. Me old man, obviously I um, uh, the loyal followers will know that I uh, I was willing to put my money where my mouth is and had a fair bit of my uh, f- total finance on the day, <laughs> and um, I was whipping them home as if I've been a twenty three year member, and. Uh, <laughs> When it was quarter time, the old man and I were texting and we said, we've never seen a team like this. It's game over. They're going to win this by over 100 points. Because <laughs> um, he looked that convincing in the first quarter. We know what happened in the second, but run me through that first quarter firstly. What you thought of? What you thought of your jump start? Well, it's the start that I thought we'd have. Everyone was talking about the dogs would come out firing, the dogs will do this, the dogs will do that. Um, in every final, we had that start. In the final, a couple of years ago in 2018 against Geelong, we had that start. We're pretty switched on. We, we, we can sense the moment and we know what we've got to do in, in that sort of first part of the game. So um, just before Petraka kicked that goal, we had two shots on goal um, and... Cosy Pickett's pressure was immense. Uh, uh, Alex Neil Bullen, uh, Charlie Spargo, the forwards were on, the mids were tough. Um, uh, Christian Salem really set the tone with a big tackle on McRae, lined him up and flattened him. And then I think Stephen May flattened another person, maybe a Josh Dunkley early. And that's when I was like, geez, we're in a grand final. This is it. Um, it, it goes forward. Petrarca picks it up sort of on the half volley, swings around on the right. And just before he kicks it, I said, we're on. Well, we're all over him here. We're all over him. Yeah. Slots the goal. And I, I felt quite settled after that. Um, and, yeah, we just played <coughs> our, our brand in the first term. And it, it was that high pressure, high intensity, um, contested brand that we've been playing all year. So we've had sort of 20 dress rehearsals for this sort of moment. Um, and they just looked. At home, even though the pressure was on and it was high intensity, uh, uh, Trent Rivers had some really nice moments in the first quarter, really composed, and he's 19. He's 19. So yeah. when he was sort of composed, picking the ball up at ground level, um, Hamble and Salem and just settling us down, um, yeah, I felt quite good. And then Fritta kicked the next one on the line. Tom Sparrow chipped it over the top and Fritta kicked the next one. And at that moment, I, I, I sat back in my chair a little bit and, and felt all right, but... I probably felt, I don't know if you felt the same, but I probably felt we left a couple of goals out there in the first term. Um, mm. So I felt like we could have been two 
two goals up the further ahead, and that's why I was I was happy, but I wasn't quite um, fully convinced yet. H- how did you see the first term? Yeah, no, I thought it was exactly what was going to happen. Um, dominant, and it, like I said, I just thought that you were going to keep on going. I didn't see <laughs> how the Bulldogs were going to turn the momentum. I knew that in any game of football, it could be top of the ladder versus bottom. At some point, there is going to be a momentum shift. Mm. It could be, it could just be a two goal stem the tide before the other team yep. takes the momentum back and piles on 10. But you knew the Dogs were going to get their little run at some point, but I definitely didn't see what was coming in the second quarter. And, you know, we, we've talked about the D's Geelong game before, but it, when you were 40 points down against the Cats... I still had faith. You know, obviously Mm. you think it's incredibly unlikely to come back from 40 points down, but I thought the Ds still have another punch to pull here. Yep. Uh, And then when... uh, when, But I must admit, when the Dogs went 20 (laughs) points up, something deep inside me went, oh, God, they've lost this. I thought the Dogs are just going (laughs) to keep on running away. And I didn't want to say anything. I actually pulled... um, I actually uh, messaged me mate Michael and said to him, mate... uh, I have a horrible feeling the dogs are just going to run away with this. Mm. Uh, and sure enough, we know what happened there. But how do you reckon the dogs managed to wrestle that much momentum back to the point where, well, it would have been, what, nearly a 40-point turnaround or close to. They would have been around three goals down and ended up three goals up, didn't they? Yep, yep. Um, I've got no idea. I think Luke Beveridge is an absolute genius, whatever he did. Because Gorney said that at the start of the game, we were playing it on our terms and then they switched it up a little bit to play the game a different way in the second term. And then the D's adjusted in the third. Um, but he, he put it down to the dogs changing up their style a little bit. Uh, they were just walking it out of the centre clearance for a little patch there, which did remind me of the Geelong game. And then they just took their moments. Like I, I think in the first term we left a couple of snags out on the park, but uh, a, a Trelaw, he, he'd snap a couple of just quick goals over his head in amongst the, the fire and fury. And then they they went back and another centre clearance and, um, and Aaron Norton picks it up at his toes, snaps it over his head and it floats through. And everything they were touching were turning to gold. And then we were down the other end and we missed a couple of chances. I think Ben Brown might have missed one. And, um, well, Gorney kicked one straight through the middle of the big sticks. And that, 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 that wasn't allowed. That was a sausage roll, wasn't it? It was. It, like, it was. from every angle I've seen, that's a goal. And Gorney, you know as a kicker, and I don't think Gorney's the type to make a song and dance for the sake of theatrics. I reckon he really believed that that was a sausage roll. So, yeah, that one was a bit beyond me. I don't understand. Maybe they've been instructed, the goal umpires, that you don't go to the, uh, the score review for something like a set shot where, mm. you know, because that is... Then what? Like you can't get that wrong, really. It's your job. Set shot. There's no chaos. You ha- you're on your point. The go- the goals kick. There's no camera angle that is that has a better view than yep. you standing right below the ball. So maybe they've said you can't go to a score review from that type of type of set shot because mm. you have the best eyes in the house. But it, it just shaped. St- it shaped the way it should have. Like it started right, came back. I reckon it went like over the post in terms of. I reckon it floated through above the height of the posts, but it felt like it was just a fraction in. And I sort of under, and I reckon it started right and swung left. So whether the illusion looks like it went through, but it actually at the point of the post floated over the top. So the umpire's right. Or whether it looked like it was floating over the post from like 20 meters away and snuck in and he's just gone with it. But it, it it was, it looked more in than out. And what stitched the umpire up a little bit, there was a video going around on social media and it was from behind the goals. And that almost looked conclusively uh, through the big sticks. But then again, I feel like if we well, were right under it, the umpire probably would have had an angle that I reckon could have yeah, swung the evidence. So Maybe, it, maybe. But I reckon it looks... The reason why we're questioning it is because it's called a point. I mm. reckon... I reckon if it was the other way around, it was called called a goal. I don't think there'd be anyone saying, "Hang on, that was a point," you know. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So, so that's why I tend to think that it it is a goal. Like, because from yeah, every angle yeah. I've seen, there you pay that a goal, not one supporter is there going, "Hang on, that was a point." So yeah, yeah, um, no, very, right. very, 
Very, very confusing one, uh, that one. And the, once again, this is a bit of uh, Mystic Mac, a bit of predictive things that we, we talked about earlier in the season. But because of that incident, uh, I was watching on your Sunday footy shows and whatnot. Once again, they brought up the captain's They did. Call. I did see that. And it has to come in. How many times, like we've seen in grand final key moments, uh, it was at the Collingwood St Kilda game or the John game where the ball blatantly hit the post and... You know, mm. these are the sort of decisions. If if Melbourne had have lost by four points, oh, man. by golly gosh, you know, you would have burned AFL headquarters down. So I love the idea of a captain's call. We were the ones who uh, uh, pioneered it early in this season. You, you've and, na- uh, yeah, you've nailed a couple of things uh, this year on the pod and it's been quite impressive. I have been <laughs> Thanks, mate. I appreciate it. it. A couple of your takes, which have, I don't know. It's Yeah, it's been... It's been something to behold, but um, in that second term, yeah, we missed some chances or denied some chances, and then what really got me a little bit worried in the second term was Bont. Took a couple of contested grabs front of the pack, and he's going back, and it's one of those ones where it's like, geez, if he misses this, it feels like their last sort of shot at it. Like, they are coming so hard at the moment. If he doesn't take one of these opportunities, um, you feel like it'll like we'll be able to exhale a little bit and he just nailed him. And I think he nailed two, two marks, similar pocket, goes back and slots them. And it's like, oh geez, it's it's half time now. We're down by How worried were you at half time so were you the, starting to plan the uh plan the commiseration speech? Or? Uh no, not yet. But they had one last clearance with about ten seconds to go in the last uh, in in the second quarter just before half time and they had a blazing shot. I think it was Lockie Hunter right on the siren. And as he kicks it, I go, if he kicks this, we lose. And dad yeah. goes, shut up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I, I was just a little bit down and I'm like, they've got all, if he kicks this, we're not like, we're not going to win. And he missed. Um, and we get into half time, and I, I felt all right. I, I, I was a little bit nervous though. And I hit up a couple of people. I think I hit you up and I hit Mitter up and I, I hit Druzy up in particular. And um, I go, oh, Drewsy, bloody hell, you know, this is, this is shattering. And, and he goes, mate, in my predictions, because I, I did his potty um, last week, he goes, oh, in, in our video, you predict the Ds to be down at um, half time, and you said they'll charge back in the third. And I go, oh, oh. Mystic, Mystic <laughs> McDonald. <laughs> and I go, I totally forgot about that, Drews. And it <laughs> <laughs> that calms the nerves. It does calm the nerves a little bit, because, <laughs> well, because. I said I could see that happening. Like last week I could see a real tough tussle where potentially we're down at half time, but we'll overpower them. But then I, I wrote back to Drews and I said, yeah, I, I could see that happening, but not after being 20 points up. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, once yeah. we got 20 points up, I sort of, uh, I, yeah, didn't intend us to <laughs> to then let them back in it and give them the lead. So at half time I felt all right. I felt okay. I spoke to Mito. I missed the whole... I was starting to get a little bit tipsy, to be honest. Um, yeah, and I, as I, you do. I, I missed the whole halftime show. I assume it was good in the dark. It looked okay. Birds of Tokyo. Yep. Uh, I missed it as well, actually. I think I was so upset at because at this point <laughs> I thought uh, two thousand two thousand dollars has gone begging here, and I just started playing a bit of beer pong myself. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, the, yeah, the right thing to do. I, <laughs> I, I was pretty reluctant to get back and watch it in the third, but um, I just complete. I missed the whole the whole halftime show and then Mitter goes, oh, the game's about to start. And I go, oh, geez, is it? So I race back in and Gorney and that are in the ruck ready to go again. So I sit back down and I'm waiting for the big explosion. I'm waiting for the third term, the change at the tide. I'm waiting for the premiership quarter. And we could not get our hands on it for the first 10 minutes of that third term. And I, I'm becoming more nervous and more nervous and starting to doubt more and more. They go long. Johannesson takes a screamer. I'm going, yeah. oh, God. He kicks the goal. The next five, five, six minutes, it's all on their terms. It's in their half. Um, repeat entries. Um and then contest after contest spills out the bond. He slots one from 45. And there was a shot of Bont just going nuts and it, it hung on him for a while and James Brayshaw just goes, oh, he's having some sort of game. And I go, oh, geez, like maybe it's their day. Like he's... Well, we said on the potty last week as well that 
if you have a f- out and out champion on your team, you can beat anyone on any day because all it takes is a champion to say, "Jump on my back, I'll take you to the promised land." And it, yeah, and, it and when he's on like that, it looked like he was going to just have win the norm in a canter and get the dogs over the line. So we're down by nineteen points. Grand final, halfway through the third, and the next three minutes felt like an eternity. <laughs> So we had a couple yeah. of inside 50s that Alex Keith swallowed up. We had a couple of, um, I think, harms. We, we had a couple of chains forward that got smothered. Uh, we couldn't get it out the back line. They had just swallowed us up. We, we, they were having shot after shot, and we were just struggling to get it out of our 50. And I'm sitting there going, oh, my God. At that point, it was about halfway through the third, I started going, well, you know, I've set up this post-game live stream. That, that I will do. I'll honour my commitment. <laughs> But it's not going to be for long. It'll be for half a tops. Um, I'm just going straight to bed. I don't know how I'm going to edit this Demon Fan Diaries. It's going to be excruciating editing my despair for three, yeah. four hours. And it, it, it all just started racing through my head. And I, I, I was just, yeah, pretty, pretty, like I was pretty flat. And that, I, I sat in that feeling for about two minutes. Um, and then something that I felt was quite pivotal and, and my dad definitely feels like it was pivotal and he, he said it straight away was uh, there was a contest on the wing Max Gorn gets it and he sort of he's jogged across the line and he sort of he's potentially turned off from player mode like you've crossed the line so you can relax um, there, there's two there, this could be two it, this could go one of two ways uh, and I will explain both ways but the way I I saw it live was Max Gorn crosses the live uh, crosses the line turns off from football gets slung into the deck and I thought he got caught off unaware yeah and I thought he got because once you cross the line you don't expect to get tackled it's a dead ball so he's crossed the line he's got swung around he was either not expecting it or he was playing for a free I reckon he was playing for a free. Yeah, so he's either over exaggerating. Which is fair enough. Your, top, your side's down by three goals or whatever in a grand final and you'll do anything you can to get that kick. Yeah, yeah. So, he's yeah, he's either over exaggerated it or he was just like, yeah, not not really ready for it because he'd crossed the line. But his head smacked the turf regardless. And um, I think at least on two occasions this year, Caleb Daniel got cited for dangerous tackles. Um, he, yep. he creamed someone from Brisbane earlier in the year, might have been Leicester, and he just twisted his body onto his head and he got done for a dangerous tackle. And then I reckon towards the back end of the year, he got uh, sort of, yes, yeah, cited for another incident. So when I saw that, I was like, I've seen him do this a couple of times throughout the year where he tosses people on their head. Uh, this was over the boundary when Gorney wasn't expecting it. Bit of mayo, potentially, prob- probably. Um, but the, the way his head <laughs> smacked... The concrete. I was, I was so like, "What are you doing?" Um, and then to stand over him, I thought it was at the time. And, and Muhammad it, Ali mode. And if I was a if I was a bulldog supporter, I would be cheering. I'd be like, "Bloody oath, we're on here, we're on." Yeah, like the smallest man on the ground is taking just, down the biggest, t- and he's standing over down him. The captain standing over him. I'd probably have yeah. Adrenaline through the veins with excitement. It, it could have easily gone the other way where the dogs kick the next five and that's the turning point where you go, when Daniel stood over yeah. Gorn, the smallest man over the biggest, <laughs> that's when you knew game was over and the dogs won it. I looked at that moment and I was just fuming. I was seething. Dad goes, if that doesn't fire you up, if that doesn't fire him <laughs> up, and I'm going, blood, like, oh, oh, it was just this sort of, we, we've got you. It was him looking down going, you thought, yeah, look, we've got you. Like It was just this, oh, just, and it was just, we, we've copped this for years. We've copped teams standing over us. We've copped supporters standing over us. And it just felt like for a split second there, we were back 10 years ago with just being intimidated, being overawed, being beaten. And it just sort of glanced in my mind of like, oh God, maybe we're not out of... Maybe we haven't moved away from what we've copped for many, many moons. Anyway, the next contest or two contests later, there's a stoppage. Viney barges through a couple. Bailey Smith tries to grab it. It just falls out of his hands. Harmsy gets it. Bullet kick. Spots Fritter on the on the tit. There's about nine minutes left of this third term. What a shoe that was. That was just lace out into the space. That was a beautiful kick. There's about nine minutes left in the term and it just felt like this had to go in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we're watching Fritter line up and it's kickable, but it just feels like if he misses this, 
It's probably our last yeah. chance at it. Bailey Fritch goes back, slots it, sneaks it home. Um, and then I felt like, oh, God, we need the next. And then, as I said just before. The explosion. Yeah, big contest. Bailey Fritch gets it out. Uh, up, um, Not Bailey Fritch. Petrarca gets it out. Bailey Fritch goes for mark of the year. Lands like a cat. Goal. And then from there, the the momentum had shifted. And when Clayton Oliver kicked that last one, uh, that was just unbelievable. Um, I I don't know if you watched, you would have. I've seen the Sunday footy show and they did their analysis of it. And it was so unbelievable to see the glaring mistake the dogs made where they didn't have anyone protecting the back of the stoppage. Mm. The Brownie showed the vision. And I can't fathom that. You have Petrarca and Oliver and these blokes running through and they didn't have the sweep bar behind the stoppage. And, you know, that's okay. You know, you just try and dominate the midfield. But when they kick two in a row or three in a row, you'd think you'd try and stem the tide and someone play a def- as a defensive midfielder, surely. But it didn't happen. And then next thing you know, the Demons have won by 70 points. So <laughs> as much as we love Bevo, and uh, I don't want to for a second pretend like I know a bit more about coaching the game of Australian rules football than Luke Beveridge. But Jesus, back <laughs> of the stoppage, mate. We learned that at local level. Uh, there was one clear shot where I thought, geez, we're, we're on here and I, it might have been Petrarca's goal or maybe one straight after the stoppage but it cuts to Bont and he had his head down they were down by maybe two goals and he was just flat as a tack and I went I reckon we might have broken him here I reckon we might have yep. broken this thing wide open when their captain's walking back to the stoppage um, and he looks like he'd rather be anywhere else but in the middle of Optus Stadium I went oh I reckon it, it, the dam might open and Something that was quite pivotal, and your dad did text me after the game. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he said Luke Jackson staying in the in the ruck. So so what happened was Gorney comes off, and there's about five minutes to go, and uh, they said, "Oh, your next rotation is going into the ruck." And he goes, "Leave Luke Jackson in there. I'll rotate forward if you want, but he's on fire. Leave him in there." And I think there was a stat where thirty nine. Like thirty nine points came from when Luke Jackson was in, um, was in, in in the ruck contest, and zero points came from when Gorn was in the ruck contest in that period or something. So he he was massive. Luke Jackson, when it hit the deck, was an extra midfielder, and and you see some of the stoppages he burst out, and he's putting ten meters on any other mid, let alone any other ruckman, and he's ha- and he's keeping up with Oliver and Petrarca and, and feeding it off to them. Um, Without that 19-year-old kid in the grand final, especially in that third term, I'm not sure we get over the line. It goes to show the maturity of Max Gorn as well and pure leadership. Like He's the captain of this team, arguably the best ruckman in the league, in my opinion, the best ruckman in the league. For him to tell Goody, mate, don't worry about... For him not to have that big of an ego, to have such small of an ego <laughs> that he can say, don't worry about putting me back in the ruck, let the 19-year-old Lukey Jackson take the reins. That's some of the all-time leadership I've ever seen from a skipper. You know, and everyone would assume leadership as a captain would mean going into the yeah. ruck, dominating the <laughs> game and single-handedly winning it off your own hand or boot. But for him to just so selflessly say, no, nah, play Lukey Jackson there and I'll go <laughs> linger in the forward line, that is phenomenal leadership. I can't think of any other captain I know that to do that. I remember a couple of years ago when Max Gorn didn't play um, and it, it's – and that this sort of mindset reminded me of early in the sort of 2010s. But when Max Gorn didn't play, I'd just sort of give up. I, I'd sort of go to the G going, we, we've got absolutely no chance now. And early in the 2010s, if Nathan Jones was ever out, you know, I'm going, well, we're absolutely no chance. We were no chance with him in. But um, when, he, when he wasn't playing, this lack of confidence, you know, came into my mindset. Nowadays, I, I think we definitely need Max Gorn in the side, but there's been multiple moments throughout the season when Luke Jackson's in and I feel more confident with him in there that will win the clearance than sometimes when Max is in there because he he creates this havoc ball like he doesn't give um get hit out to advantage all the time even though I, I reckon he's probably underrated in his rucking craft he's not too bad but he's still got to work on that a little bit but he'll sort of halve the ruck and then when it hits the ground he lands like a cat and he's off like Luke Jackson's off and his hands for a big man are exceptional he's almost got and you know take this with a grain of salt I'm excited we just want a flag but he's almost got Clayton Oliver Nouse with his yeah. ground ball he, he sort of picks it up and flicks it and hits it 
one of the other mids very, very quickly, very, very quick hands. Um, it's just amazing. It's amazing. And what he did in that third term was was crazy. There was one moment in particular. I reckon it's when Clayton Oliver kicks that last goal, puts us up by 24. Um, yeah, it's a little uh, soccer off the ground from Viney, spills out to Luke Jackson, picks up at pace, uh, off his toes, picks up, looks up, hits the handle of Cl- uh, Clayton Oliver, Clayton Oliver kicks the goal. And just we're not used to Ruckman running around the way Luke Jackson runs around. It, it is nah. incredible. Um, Jay, wouldn't you love to see a, a – you know, and we're talking a couple of years' time. It's grass now, but a couple more years of development. And Lukey Jackson in the ruck, tapping it down to obviously track and Oliver already starves. But throw a Cosby Pickett in there as well. Mm. And you've just got one of the most dynamite, explosive – X factor midfields you've ever seen, including Lukey Jacks. Could you do you see a world where there's a ball up, Gorn's in the ruck, and Lukey Jackson's in the midfield? Well, yeah, that's what they said when he got drafted. Um, <laughs> when he got drafted, oh, I can't remember the quote, but uh, Gorny hit up our recruiter, and um, oh, I don't actually have the quote, but uh, essentially, Gorn hit up the recruiter and said, uh, they said, oh. It could be gone down to Jackson. Like this bloke could be a mid, and apparently Gorn texts back the recruiter and said, "Could be Jackson down to Gorn," as in like Gorn, <laughs> Gorn goes in the mid- midfield. <laughs> oh, that'd be a pisser. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's the, they they said, "Oh, is Luke Jackson going to be a forward?" They're like, "He could play the wing. He could play forward. He could play ruck. He could be the ruck rover. Could play anywhere." Um. Well, m- moving moving on from Lukey Jackson's heroics in the third quarter, we get we get to the last. Um, after your explosion and, and the good times just kept on going. Do you want to run us through quickly the last quarter? Then I want to know your feeling and emotion after the game. Obviously, it was happiness, but was there anything more specific you can tell us? Was there a flashback to when you were belted by 200 points at the Cattery <laughs> or anything along the lines of that and it was all worth it? Um, yeah, well, so the, the last term, uh, it was just so one-sided. It was ridiculous. The first... Uh, clearance goes out to Tom Sparrow Tom Sparrow hits up Ben Brown Snaps on through for a goal And then from there You know we're 30 points up And I'm going I think we're home But you don't allow yourself to accept it Like yeah it, It's not over till it's over Any, You know A lot of neutral supporters are probably like Oh it's over It is what it is But Tom McDonald was lining up for goal after the fire And you were there going <laughs> Hang on it's not over yet He's Anything t- could happen here <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Um, yeah, so Benny Brown slots it. Uh, Ed Langdon slots one. Um, and then I think the next one was Alex Neil Bullen. And we're 36 points up. And he goes back, set shot. There's about 12, 11 minutes left. And at that moment, I went, we've won the flag. So we're up by 42 points. And at that moment, I allowed myself to accept that it was going to happen. And I had never done that all year. Like, even, you know, round six, you're saying, we're going to win the flag. And I'm going, oh, no, we're no chance. Um, round, round 13, we're talking about it. Round 18, we're talking about it. Um, after the qualifying, we're talk about, talking about it. And I'd never, ever, um, deep down, accepted that it could happen. And then when Alex Neil Bullen kicks that one in the last, I went, it's going <laughs> to it's gonna bloody happen. And then from there, it was just crazy because... It wasn't like for us in particular. It wasn't like the game petered out. We had five more goals to kick from there. So it was this celebration of like Salem going forward, chipping one over the top. Um, Salem was incredible. I think it was like 97% disposal efficiency or something like that. Just With with like 28 he's, touches. He's, well, he's everything we wanted Sam Petrovsky to be. Just that clean, classy decision maker off half back. Oh, God, I'm so impressed with Salem. He's very tough as well. And now we've got... Jake Bowie on the other side, who is going like w- when Jake Bowie got drafted, his sort of model was the Caleb Daniel or the yeah. the Jaden Short. Like th- the in vogue thing at the moment is the small defender with elite skills can hold their own defending, but just elite skills off off the back line. And um, Salem's been that for us. He, he plays like a mid off the back line, uh, but to have Jake Bowie on the other side, who's played seven games, he's never lost a game. Um, come in and yeah, play the way he plays it. it it's crazy. Apparently, Goody said at three quarter time he said um, his master stroke <laughs> uh, coaching decision uh, he said at half time was get it and boot it because yeah. at that point our surge football 
had them in a state of panic. So in the last quarter, all you see is just the boys chucking it on the boot, getting it forward. Um, yeah, that final moment where Tom McDonald gets, I think he might have kicked one before this in the last, but he gets one right on the siren. And I sort of felt bad for him because all the boys are celebrating and he hasn't quite kicked the goal yet. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I'm like, oh, I'll wait, wait for Tommy. Anyway, and, and it was the perfect, like, the perfect moment. Because if he missed that, it would have been like, you know, lit off anyway. Slide any, yeah. yeah but it would have been one of those ones where it was like, siren went, yeah. Whoa. Oh, like there would have been this like little exhale of disappointment, but he slots it and then it was just jubilation. It was just unbelievable. Um, it's something I never thought I'd ever see. Just to see all the blokes jumping on each other and all the players that didn't play run out um, in their grand final Guernseys and they're all jumping on each other um, to, to see like the blokes up on, up on the dais, the, the dais getting their, um getting the medallion, the cup getting lifted, the lap of honor. It's all these things that I have seen every year, but even when the confetti's coming down in Melbourne colors, it's just not really computing. It's like, what is happening? Am I in this alternate universe? Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was just, it was crazy. Well, after the game, you've already told me this. We've spoken a couple of times since. But, uh, yeah, a nice little uh, grand final moment yourself. You, all the way from Melbourne, managed to find your way inside the Perth changing room. <laughs> um, and there there was a Melbourne fan, I don't know if you saw on the news, who flew up to Darwin uh, to cross the border illegally using fake passes, got <laughs> himself that, into yeah. the into the Melbourne rooms and now is in jail and is like, faces a maximum one year in jail or... Fifty thousand has to pay fifty thousand mm. uh, dollars. You managed to get yourself into your room, so however, it wasn't in an illegal fashion. Do you want to run us through that? Um, yeah, so I I just watched the ceremony. I'd watched them do the lap of honor, and I had about half an hour till my live stream because um, I was going to do a post game live stream no matter what. It was either going to be a celebration or I was going to front up for half an hour, accept the loss and probably go to bed straight after but um, I start setting up my live stream and my phone is going absolutely bananas like it was just going off the dial and I was chatting to chatting to you chatting to Mita chatting to everyone that I could but my phone just wouldn't stop going off and I was getting message requests on Twitter and Facebook and left right and center I'm getting all these random names pop up from from some people that might have followed me through it uh, the years that were really happy for me so I definitely appreciated um, the efforts of people to try and contact me but I had this thing pop up on my phone and it said, Sam has request requested a video call on Facebook. And when people sort of request message me on Facebook, I don't really like it. Um, Facebook seems quite private. And I don't mind like a random DM on Insta because that's like a public account. But when I get like uh, message requests on Facebook, it makes me a little bit uncomfortable. So I, I, I see this thing pop up while my phone's going crazy and it said... Um, getting a video request from Sam. And I go, oh, who, who is this Sam guy? So I click on. I'm surprised you answered. I If if you told me Caden's got a random video call, Sam is requested to call you on Messenger, <laughs> I would have give, paid it $10 odds for you to answer that call. So I missed it initially. And then I went through to see what the notification was because the missed call was like in my um, Facey Messenger inbox. So yep. um, it's popped up. I've missed it. And then I click on the inbox and the inbox is one that I've had dialogue before with. Um, yeah. It, it was Sammy Wiedemann had, had video oh, called how me. How good is that? And I've chatted to Sammy before after we did um, the footy golf video. Um, he, he hit me up and said, mate, great stuff. You know, good, good luck. You know, in the media, you're going to smash it. Like he's, he's very supportive lad, Sammy Wiedemann. And I've had, um, yeah, a, a few chats with him before where I, I'll absolutely love the bloke. Like, um, we, we He's a superstar. I've only met him the once and then as far of that, I've just seen him in sort of bits and pieces content with you and I like to watch him closely, closely in the post-game interviews and what that, not just because he does seem like a ripper bloke and he is one of the all-time genuine fellas. Yeah, he's unbelievable. Like we, we met him when we um, after the 2018 win and we got to chat to him then. He's just a really good sport. Um, he... he yeah, messages me every now and again, sort of going, oh, mate, you know, content's going well. He's just, he's one of the, the best blokes ever. I, I absolutely love him. Anyway, I see this video call pop up and I've gone, I've bloody missed it. Oh, no. So while I'm setting up my stream, um, I call him back on, on FaceTime and he pops up. He's got a beer in hand. He's got the, the D's jumper on. 
He's like, Kalos, how good was that, mate? How good was that? <laughs> I'm like, Sammy. Oh, that is so good. <laughs> I'm like, Sammy, mate, it was unbelievable. Um, he's like, I can't really hear you, but just wanted to call you and say, mate, did you enjoy that? How good was that? <clears throat> I'm like, Sammy, i got to put you on with Dad. i got to put you on with Dad. He's like, yeah, bloody oath. So I, I pop out of my, my little studio, head through, Dad's sort of watching the post game, and I just shove my <laughs> phone in the face of Dad. And he's like, oh, what's this? He's like... Sammy, Sammy, what's going on? He's like, oh, how good was that? How good was that? Um, he couldn't really hear us because he was in the rooms, but there was a lot of like bloody oath, mate. That was elite. So um, he starts panning around to a couple of the other players and they're walking past going, Kados, Kados. So it, oh, it, what a moment. That uh, is a cherry on top of one hell of a grand final day, I'd have thought. And, and yeah, it, it was, um, yeah, of course. It was unbelievable. And, you know, I... I'm very thankful for Sam Wiedemann to even think of me in that moment. But it was quite funny. I um, Because I talk about Sammy Weeds a lot, um, especially to GPAT. I go, oh, Sammy Weeds, you know, message me today. And it does make me day. I, I know on one part, it, it's like, it just makes me day. It, you know, he's just, Well, he's, no, I, I'll meet a girl uh, just passing her at a party, say one word, and I think I'm half a chance. So I'll message her, and she'll reply three days later, a courtesy message back, and I feel on top of the world. Yeah. So when you've got a just super, you know, will be superstar for your football club, bringing you after a grand final, <laughs> of course you're going to be on top of the world. It, it, but it's just the, like he's taking his time. It's just so kind. It's such a kind thing to do. And um, I, I told Georgia, and because Georgia knows how much I rant, um, I, I rant and rave about Sammy Weed, she, like she hears, you know, Sammy Weed replied to, you know, me doing a video. Oh, Sammy Weed wrote and said, great stuff, Kados. And she goes, he just seems like the nicest bloke. So she, she loves him too. But um, I told her on Sunday that he, he'd called me after the grand final and I put him on with dad. And she just, starts bawling her eyes out. Like she was like giggling and laughing and had tears rolling down her face and she's like... It is a beautiful moment. I told Dad about it last night and I, I don't know if I added a bit of mustard here, but I said I sort of said, you know, when Sam Wiedemann was copying it from all angles, you were sort of, uh, you know, you were just supporting him on the channel. Um, and well, I'd uh, defend that bloke at any at any instant. And, and there's been times where I've sort of justified why he wasn't playing this year, but I've never... There was a real sort of uh, witch hunt for him a couple of years ago um, with, with his contract situation and people saying he was terrible. and uh, Well, not terrible. No one said he was terrible, but everyone was sort of just on him for, for no real reason. And I, I've always tried to have his back, but also tried to justify why he wasn't getting a game at times. But I've been really optimistic about him as a footballer. But as a bloke, he's just first class. He's, um, as you said on the phone, he's, he is that bloke that... Um, you want your daughter to bring home. He's just the most loveliest bloke ever. And I just really, really appreciated that moment. And, and yeah, telling Georgia on Sunday, she understood how much that sort of meant to me. And she just starts bawling her eyes out. <laughs> it was quite yeah. funny. She's giggling and going, I know I shouldn't be crying at this, but that's the nicest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> it is, isn't it? That is so <laughs> mean. Uh, I love that story. Well, uh, you don't want to move on too quickly. You know, we have just won the premiership. We want to bask in it. No. <laughs> but we, we want to bask in the glory. But um, before we sort of wrap up, we everyone's talking dynasty, and I tend to agree. Who do you see being your main challenger next year? We, we pretty confident the D's are going to be there. Or, you know, we we think Port Adelaide aren't quite up to it. We think that uh, you know we're not sure the dogs are going to take enough strides forward to come back. Mm. Uh, Geelong are on the way down. Uh, where do you sort of uh, where do you sort of see your main competition coming from next season? All right, so hear me out, and this is the WWE in me, and yeah. and there's not much WWE in me, but here, here, no, uh, there's uh, a lot more WWE. <laughs> you wouldn't believe it, Dos. I was hoping you'd watch this later because halfway through the pod, I just put me WWE Championship belt on, <laughs> Did just you? for no apparent reason. Yeah, um, that's quite funny. Well, yeah. Oh, th there's not much WWE in me, but if there was, Melbourne Footy Club have just taken the title off one of the best dynasties we've ever seen. They have a full preseason and they come back last dance style to stake their claim. Two big oh. Melbourne teams, two big MCG tenants, the oh. Richmond Football Club and Goose the pops. Melbourne Football Club in 12 months in the grand final. Petrarca versus Dusty. Um, 
I I am not greedy at all, and I am not someone who. I definitely don't think you just walk into a grand final and you have to earn it. But if we can do what we did this year and somehow make it again, I think the storylines of the Tigers coming back to try and take their mantle back off this young Melbourne footy club just screams classic. I'm tingling in spots <laughs> I, I didn't quite know I could tingle. That is, that is yeah, that that's a story lot that's a fairy tale storyline I'd love it, to see. I think yeah. I think it's inevitable Richmond make the eight. I don't know what they're paying, but I can guarantee you they do. And um sort of half mystic max style again, if they make the eight, their finals football brand holds up. So But just yeah, because I mean, because they, they are the best team and I feel like they've got a couple of years left in them and I think for certain reasons they fell apart this year, but them at their best and, and just that sort of um They'd have the hunger back to reclaim the title again. And and if the D's knock them off, it is changing of the guard. But if the Tigers yeah. knock the D's off, it's like they never they you're never the left. Bridesmaids. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, but now that I think about it, I think the Brisbane Lions are, will be another decent crack at it. I think they're they're sort of the two that, um, if we were lucky enough to make it, I think could be quite cool to, to play off again. Well, Dossie, surely we 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 actually agreed before the show we're not going to do any prep for this one because we can just walk straight in and talk about that grand final for six hours. But we surely we can't have our first episode of the year without a GBO be you know the last episode of the year. So. I think we best make up some GBOs on the fly. All right. Well, I reckon we've um, gone over a couple. But um, well, my, my, I can tell you my out on the full uh, to start with is uh, probably you have to be uh, poor old Basil Zemplitz who had a bit of a you don't want to <laughs> you don't want to kick a man too harshly when he's down, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to not give Goodwin his chance to have the speech. There's nothing better when the coach gets up there and goes, and to the supporters, and the supporters go, yeah. Yeah, and then, it is. <laughs> yeah, and the coach feels on top of the world. So bit of an out of the fool to me time Zemplis there. Yeah. <laughs> I saw someone on Twitter say, if Basil Zemplis did the 2004 AFL Grand Final, we never would have got, Don Scott, you were wrong. <laughs> and then the choking, yeah. of, the, uh, choking of the tie. Uh, my out of the fool... I whacked a couple down very, very quickly. Um, it, it was C- Caleb Daniel, but that's probably a little bit harsh. He was trying to do everything for his footy side, trying to intimidate uh, the big Maxi Gorn. Whether you agree with it or not, it was a little bit bizarre from my end. But, yeah, in that moment, I was quite furious and quite angry that uh, that Caleb Daniel had done that. But I yeah. think that's a little bit harsh for out on the full. So that might be behind. I'm going to move my out on the full to the bloke who went over and uh, skipped the quarantine and, and was sort of uh, liaising in the in the rooms. I I, I thought it was uh, pretty poor and I know that the bloke is a really passionate D supporter and he's got the bar down in St Kilda and he's painted it red and blue and he's flown over. But um, I, in particular, I never had the opportunity to go, um, even with my commitments, uh, you know, in, in and around the AFL world, there was no real opportunity for me to go. But Um, I was reluctant internally, even if there was, because I didn't want to get some sort of special green card to go through an opportunity and have a lot of me mates and a lot of Melbourne supporters watch me go over and enjoy enjoy it when they couldn't. So uh, I, I I wasn't given an opportunity, but as I was sort of thinking about it, I don't think I would have gone even if I had, because the guilt that I would have had, been at the ground while so many people uh, missed out. I'd have gone. I'd have taken it with both <laughs> hands. Fuck everyone else. You've put in the hard yards <laughs> making five videos a week for four years. You've earned the right to be there. But, um, yeah, seeing old mate at the ground, I thought it it just wasn't a good look. And that that's my behind and out on the full wrapped into one. What's your behind, Roddy? Uh, my behind is the grand final away from Melbourne because Optus mm. did put on – quite the show and everyone that's over there from your Gary Lyons to your Kane Corns say it was, you know, it, it was the biggest celebration of football you've ever seen the whole week over there. And now there are talks of potentially once every four years, the MCG selling the rights so that um, a team interstate can have it. And I love the thought of that. I think if Carlton finished on top of the ladder um, and we – played in a grand final, and every year we had to play in Perth against the West Coast, I would be spewing. And that's what has to happen for interstate teams. Mm. They can finish on top of the ladder, 
and they have to play their grand final at the MCG against the side that's finished fourth and um, their home ground's the MCG. So I like this thought of shipping it around once every four years. Keep it at the G for the most part. But yeah, it was sad to see it somewhere else again for another year running. But I actually am open to the fairness and possibilities that comes with it being elsewhere. I love that. The only thing is, I reckon, because I loved it. I loved it at Optus. Um, and it obviously, in a normal year, if it's at Optus, I can still go. The only thing that sucked yep. this year is we weren't allowed in the state. But in a normal year, if it's at Optus, I've got no qualms paying the flight. Yeah, that would just be the best week of my life. That'd be gr- a great part of it. It'd almost be better for it, me and you instead of being... Well, it, it doesn't get much better than 100k at the G, but to have a little holiday as well, you fly over to Perth, you so excitement exciting. on the plane, you tour the city the whole week, and then bang, you're at a new stadium you've never been to. I think it's an amazing opportunity, and it's probably a bit unfair that Melbourne just gets the tourism every year when... Every, every other state is a, is a pretty beautiful place. The only issue is that you could definitely have it at Optus. You I was could just about to prob- say that. Yeah, you could probably have it at Adelaide Oval. Definitely you know, could. They could, yep. they, could, they could have a rip. They could put on a show. But then you couldn't really have it no, that's in it Brisbane. For mine. No, that's it. Yeah, you uh, because have it in Brisbane. the you SCG have it in isn't up to scr- uh, scratch in terms of a, a footy oval. Um, you know, it's a great stadium, but their footy oval, I think, the dimensions are way off and you're not playing it at A and Z. And then we're not going down to a Launceston or Hobart for the grand final. So I'm happy for it to go to the two um, brand new stadiums in well, brand new, you know, 10, 10, yeah. five, 10 years old in Adelaide Oval and um, Optus Stadium. But I, I don't really see it going anywhere anywhere else. Well, I don't say I don't see any issue with that. And I don't think Brisbane or anywhere else could have too many complaints if they say, um, yeah, three out of four years, it's at Melbourne, one in every... Four years it's at Optus and one in every four years it's at uh, uh, Adelaide Oval. Yeah. Or however the math checks out. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Uh, my goal is, I know I spoke about him at the top of the uh, the show, is Gussie Brayshaw. I just felt like he's been so selfless this season and he's sort of been um, the benchmark for the Melbourne Footy Club in terms of his selflessness. He you know, obviously finished third in the Brownlow and got 30 touches for fun in 2018 when he was an inside mid and he's been put out on a wing and he plays, I've said this before on the pod, he plays like a Jake Lever intercepting role on the wing. He is our defensive winger. It's just ridiculous. And he gets back, he's on the last line of defense. Um, he really covers our bum at times, but during the third term when we needed someone to step up, he went around the footy, won critical contests, um, he was defensive, and then he kicked that clutch goal. He had 25 touches, a goal. It was one of the best games I've seen Angus Brayshaw play. It was inspiring. It was inspirational. And um, after the game, he was talking to Gary Lyon. He was so chuffed, and he just goes, oh, Gary, you know, I just left everything out on the park. And that, and that's the way it looked. It, it looked yeah. like that. So um, Gussie Brayshaw, who sort of cops it from every super coach fan out in the world because everyone got him for one stage there and he wasn't performing because he was playing a role for the team. Um, I think that sort of just justifies his last couple of years. Yeah, very selfless to... There aren't many players who go, all right, instead of having 30 touches plus a game, I'll go play a defensive job out on a wing <laughs> when you're built to be an inside mid. So that's the buy-in it takes to be a champion football team and big reason why he won the grand final. And my goal is the Melbourne board for supporting and sticking by Simon Goodwin through mm. Hellfire and Brimstone. Could The easy option, the easier option was to sack him, I think. Yeah. When everyone's there questioning Goodwin, is he the man? You're finishing second last. You're this long into a rebuild or whatever. The easiest option would have been to sack him. The harder option is to stick by him. Same with David Teague is where I'm sort of mm. is why I have so much empathy towards the situation because the easy option was to sack him. The hard option was to say, "Nah, we're sticking by him, supporting him, and and seeing where it goes." So I love that Melbourne had the courage to stick by him, and it's just paid the greatest dividends. Well. Throughout the year, we were talking about that coach that was potentially going to get sacked and then wasn't and then won the flag. And I we, like we had Simon Goodwin in that conversation, but he hadn't won the flag yet. He is now one of those blokes. He is now a Damien Hardwick. He is now a Bomber Thompson. He's now a... Um, a like, oh, well, there's just a multiple. Well, multiple it looks examples. like... But he's, um, now, he's now one of them. He's etched himself into that premiership coach that was on the verge of getting sacked 
Yeah. And um, we don't want, once again, we, there's no uh, guarantee that the Dees are just going to win two of the next three premierships. That's the way everyone's talking, there's no guarantee. But if you do, he's edged himself into history as one of the greatest coaches of all time if he wins two, two three, four premierships. So, And it was just on the chopping block. So it goes to show that sometimes uh, swinging the axe isn't always the best option and showing support. It's unbelievable the power of support. Someone tap you on the back mm. and say, mate, we back you in, you're doing a good job. That alone is more power than sacking a coach and getting a new one in and, and yep. giving him a clean slate. So love what the Ds have done and uh, couldn't be happier for Goodwin and the whole side. Unbelievable. What a journey it's been, uh, the Back Pocket Plugger podcast. I can't believe week in, week out, we've forensically broken down a premiership Melbourne year. I just, <laughs> It's just ridiculous. Like out of all it's the been times, fun, hasn't it? it? It's been unbelievable. Out of all the times to <laughs> chuck a body on, um, it's been crazy. Uh, Rog, thanks for joining me week in, week out uh, for the Back Pocket Plugger podcast. Hopefully you've enjoyed chewing the fat uh, with some footy throughout the year. Hopefully next year, um, yeah, we we got absolutely uh, bombarded with messages telling us that we need to stop talking about Carlton and Melbourne, but we had no choice. Carlton were in the furnace every single week, and the days were premiership favourites. So hopefully next year we're still talking about Melbourne and Carlton, but it's because both of us are at the, the top end. That would be unbelievable. Um, I appreciate you hopping on every week, Rog. This has been an absolute pleasure, and I can't wait to do this next year with you. Absolutely. We'll catch you next season. Beautiful guys. We appreciate everyone who tuned in on YouTube. We appreciate everyone who tuned in on Spotify and iTunes. And we'll see you next season to talk some more footy.